final speaker today is Keiichi Matsuda, um, uh, and I think the reason we invited him was, um, well, it will be, I think, self-evident, um, looking towards even further in the future, and almost the other way around, rather than thinking about the uh, intrusion of the, uh, the private and private interests of the public sphere, now we're talking about like, you know, the physicality of um, moving uh, data collection stuff and around that like, into the home itself. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm quite happy to be following out actually, because yeah, as you said, it's, um, I think what I'm doing here is sort of providing a, a, an example of what the world could look like if we don't implement Adam's ideas, um, although it's just equipment. So. Yes, so uh, my name is Keiichi Matsuda, I'm a designer. Um, I'm here to present to my project today, Augmented Hyper Reality. Um, it's my own kind of research by design project, and I'm afraid I've got notes, but I hope you don't mind. Um, it's, the project's an insight into the kind of future city um, and the future, in essence, of spatial design as well. Um, so it also alludes to the kind of changing nature of public space. Um, the project's based around augmented reality, which I suppose most of you have come across, but maybe haven't heard so much about recently. Um, I developed this project in 2009-2010. Uh, so it was really when augmented reality was starting to become kind of publicly um, sort of embraced. <laughs> um, but I think really what we've seen in augmented reality so far is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's possible. And in terms of my kind of grandiose thinking about augmented reality, I think it can be the sort of future of, uh, of you know, our post-human evolution and the kind of next step that we take. Um, but it's just about how we, uh, we adopt the technology that matters. Uh, so, the project is a research by design uh, project that I developed during my Masters of Architecture at the Barlet School of Architecture in London. Um, it's a sprawling look at the future of our cities and where we might be heading. Um, today I'm going to show you some films and production images like these ones from the project. Um, the project's really conceived to be kind of propositional and provocative, but also sort of critical about uh, you know, the kind of future that's, that's proposed by technology. Um, to provide a kind of counterpoint to the sort of glossy technological videos you see produced by people well, like Microsoft and, and Nokia, among others. Um, so hopefully we can use the project to sort of start to anticipate uh, design challenges and uh, kind of apply a new vision into the creation of cities. Uh, so without further ado, uh, here's the first film, Domestic Robocop. <coughs> reaction with you know some people very excited about the potential of the technology <laughs> and also some people who are kind of terrified about the potential implications of it. And I think that's really, really great and there's not enough of it. There needs to be more debate surrounding these kind of areas. 
and I, I can deeply understand the, the kind of shock that comes from it because the home has always been this sort of deeply private, personal space. And uh, but having said that, it has always been a kind of lucrative site for media invasion. Um, so you know, this started with radio, TV, internet, and so maybe this is what we can look forward to. Um, the next film is a bit uh, less cynical, but also maybe pushing rather from uh, public invasion of, of the private, more the other way around, so private invasion of the public. Um, this film is actually made in 3D, uh, but I don't have enough glasses for it, I'm afraid, so you just have to imagine. Um, it's called Augmented City 3D. So I just want to walk you through some of the kind of ideas surrounding this project um, and start with uh, the interface of the Moonstock mediation. Okay, this is a, a film still, uh, not a film still, sorry, an actual kind of shot, a photograph of my kitchen uh, from the production of the first film. And the black dots you see there are actually you know, really there. I have to stand on the, on the table and cover my uh, kitchen with the, the stickers much to the displeasure of my housemates. Um, but this was a necessary uh, adaptation of the environment that I had to make to be able to actually uh, composite all of the elements on in post production. Uh, so I, I analyzed the footage afterwards and then you know, used the, the tracking data to be able to uh, understand the 3D space and the movement of the camera. But what I found interesting about this was that there's a kind of layer that the computer is reading off of it. And augmented reality also requires some kind of um, analysis of, the, of the, uh, the input data to be able to understand the environment. So you have this kind of thing as well, like a QR code um, on the side of a building. And what I found interesting about this was that you know, we're not anymore directly communicating with our environment. You know, it's coming, the environment is speaking to a device and then that's speaking to us. So there's this kind of mediated layer involved within it. And that creates an interesting situation because suddenly, um, because we're, we're experiencing our environments partially through a mediated device, then we have this idea of subjective space coming in, that everybody can read uh, environments differently. So although we may be inhabiting the same environment, the way, we, the way it looks to us and the way we use it might be different from person to person. And you can already see this happening um, in terms of uh, electro uh where we might go into a coffee shop and one person will be using it for a meeting room, another place to meet friends, or you might be playing Game Boy on the bus or something. 
and uh, you know, everybody's using them, appropriating the space. So this is some famous maxim in architecture which goes form follows function, which is a maxim by the famous uh, Louis van der Rohe. But this is kind of becoming unstuck now because really we can start to apply the function uh, in our own kind of subjective mediative layer. <coughs> so when I was designing the film, the, uh, the first and most obvious problem was that of interface. How do we start to modulate and interact with our environment? And in the first film, you know, there were many different ways of inputting a gesture, but there was also uh, the kind of keyboard on there as well. And the more I sort of thought about it, the more ridiculous I thought this idea was that we have this amazing kind of set of ubiquitous computing and you know, a huge amount of uh, technological kind of prowess involved with the, the potential of this film, and yet we're still using kind of a typewriter. Um, so with the second film, I started to look um, at the cockpit as a model for um, interacting with environments. And I found it particularly interesting because it mapped out um, spatial, uh, sorry, information functions to spatial uh, dimensions. So you could start to kind of locate things in your mind and use your spatial memory to be able to have much greater control over what you're doing. Um, again, uh, in the film, that kind of manifested as this, which is a sort of uh, subjective mapped out space that you can kind of customize and sort of tweak to, to respond to the things that you do the most. Um, and I think this is an example of something which could be a new private space within, uh, within the augmented city. Uh, this is the, the social network sort of module within there. Um, I, I did it because I wanted to show that we weren't sort of bound by spatial constraints as well in uh, mixed reality, that we could have you know, almost complete virtual reality within it. Um, also here you can sort of start to uh, think about, uh, use the three dimensions uh, of the environment to help you understand information better. So as time passes, things move away on the z-axis, and then also you can um, you know, put your friends over in one corner of the room, and you know, your, uh, your work colleagues over in the other, and you can start to sort of use space to help you to understand information. And then finally, there's this kind of channel browser, which is this sort of three-dimensional sculptural ob object, which changes shape with every decision that you make along this decision, decision, decision tree. Uh, so the idea here that rather than reading everything here, you can start to understand the shape of it and therefore understand the decision that it's asking you to make. This is a problem as well with uh, virtual reality, but the possibilities for the types of environment that you can create in augmented reality is so vast that you start to ask yourself the question, what is ideal space? You know, what, if we could have anything, where would we want to be? So I asked a few people, and you know, everyone has different ideas, you know, depending on their own sensibilities. Uh, some people want to go back to nature and you know, be walking through a forest. Some people want to live in a uh, 18th century chateau. Some people want to live in a modern villa. Um, but I found all of these answers to be very sort of, um, I don't know, they're kind of dishonest in a way, that we're just recreating other things that we previously thought of as, as ideal. My idea of ideal space is, is this on the left, um, which is an intensely personal space. It might not look like an ideal space to you, but you know, this person has filled their environment with um, you know, things that are meaningful to them. They've customized their workspace and also their, their desktop there as well. There. And I'm sure they have some completely idiosyncratic filing system that nobody else can understand. Um, and that manifested itself in the film as, as this kind of environment where you, know, you can set things up the way you want and it's filled with the things that are meaningful to you. So the augmented city is a bit like the web. You can't eat the whole thing at once. You, know, you have to, as uh, multiple layers accumulate in different parts of the city, you have to work out a way to be able to, to um, interact with that and aggregate what you want to, to uh, how you want to define your worldview. Um, so that's what the channel browser that you saw earlier, that's how it comes into it. Um, it allows you to kind of uh, choose which layers you're interested in, and kind of your view of the city becomes almost a reflection of yourself. It's almost like mapping your personality out onto physical space. Um, I call this process aggregation, um, but there's also an opposite as well, which is broadcast. Um, this, is a big, this is one of the early production drawings that I did, uh, which was you know, how to kind of map social media and that kind of online publicized content onto sort of human body. And that manifested itself in a, um, a recent installation I did in collaboration with a guy called James Adaman. Uh, this is an interactive installation using Connect. Um, and you have all these kind of keywords that drift down and follow you throughout the space. Now this, this kind of thing where all of our public data is, um, is made kind of 
you know, directly public, like right next to us, and is a, it, it kind of scares some people as well. Um, but I think there's you know, definitely potential for exploration with, with it as well, because you know, despite the obvious kind of issues with, um, with uh, privacy, then also it could potentially usher in a sort of new age of creative collaboration and communication where um, you know, instead of our cities being filled with these kind of cold or other spaces, suddenly they'll be filled with people who we have a relation to and, and they can also relate to us. Um, but I just wanted to show you this in a way, it's not what I'm presenting today. So, okay. Um, so I think this dichotomy of uh, broadcast and aggregation is something which I found increasingly useful as a terms to replace these kind of increasingly non-useful terms of public and private. Um, but it's interesting to think as well what other sort of uh, new kind of hybrid spaces are emerging from this. And uh, one of the things is, is towards the end of the last film, we saw these two people, so the, the two protagonists, kind of meeting each other at the train station. At that point, I didn't have time to composite the whole thing, but uh, the idea was that these two people's subjective spaces would start to merge, and you'd have a kind of hybrid space between those two people's identities. And what's nice about that is that that would be a completely unique space that would only exist when you met the same person in the same space. Um, so I think this is quite an interesting thing to do, and I'd like to sort of explore some more. There's another potential hybrid space here. Um, this is the largest screen in the world. It's the, uh, the screen at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Has anyone seen it, by any chance? No problem. No problem. Yeah, but I was really interested in this, because at the inaugural game for this gigantic screen, they broadcast the live game below in 3D. So everybody's sitting you know, in the audience with their 3D glasses on, and, and no one's looking at these little players around on the pitch. And yeah, I mean, I thought that was really funny as well. I was like, why, why would you do that? Why would you pay money to go and see that? But I think I realized that I was missing the point, because the reason people go to games like this is not so that they can see some you know, tiny figures running around on the pitch. It's really to be in the crowd and be in the event, and you know, feel the kind of roar of the crowd and the kind of visceral nature of it. And augmented reality kind of understands that, I think. And uh, you can imagine some amazing AR experiences where, you know, you, you have this huge collection of a shared reality that you can experience at certain times. And these events don't have to be, you know, in an event space at a particular kind of sporting event or something like that. They can be, you know, spontaneous, they can be anywhere, and they can just be these kind of shared experiences, which is a new type of public space as well. So, uh, yeah, the question, who will design our future cities? Well, I think, uh, coming from an architectural background, that this is going to be a split profession now, that we'll have the infrastructural requirements and the economics and the logistics uh, represented by one profession, and then also the virtual there, which has the spatial qualities, the events and the experiences uh, as another profession. And we also have to consider the democratizing effects of uh, digital media itself. Um, there's this quote here uh, from Charles Lampita, which is more cultural heritage stored in digital form, plus more accessible to more people, plus people better equipped with more tools to add creatively to the collection, equals exponential growth in mass cultural expression, and he termed that cloud culture. Now he was talking about things like uh, photography and video, where as soon as they were digitized, it turned everybody into a, a producer of content. But I think this can also be applied to space, so that um, you know, as, as space can be, become, in effect, a form of media to be practiced and consumed by anybody so inclined. Um, so instead of the form of our cities being kind of dictated by architects and planners and uh, landowners, you know, suddenly they can become created by the people who actually live there, which is sort of, a, sort of crazy, but it shouldn't be. You know? <laughs> Um, so I'm, this is the anatomy of the augmented city that I just want to walk you through now. Uh, at level one, you have the, the cockpit, which is the sort of way that you control and modulate the environment. Level two here, you have the, uh, the what I call the field, which is all of your location-based information and tools, things like that. At level three, you have uh, the skin, and I also put some navigation in here for aesthetic effect, um, which is, is something which is uh, the kind of uh, virtual overlays, buildings, things like that. I think this could be a really interesting uh, new kind of cultural form that emerges from augmented reality. And then finally, you have the actual kind of built infrastructure, the, the, uh, the only sort of physical element of it. Um, so I sort of envision the augmented city as this sort of um, sprawling, dynamic, liquid city, 
uh, which sort of reacts to you and is you know, open and <coughs> and these are all the layers together. So finally, I want to uh, just show you this map. It's a famous uh, map, probably familiar to anybody in the in here, by uh, uh, Jean Baptiste Nori, that was written, uh, that was drawn in the 18th century. And it's an uh, infographic map, which means that it's uh, a, a it sorry, denotes the kind of ground floor footprint of all the buildings on here. And what's interesting about it, if you kind of zoom in, is that you can see all of the, um, in the kind of various uh, palazzos in, in Rome, where this is, uh, the space inside, which is kind of uh, accessible to the public, is open as well. So people often use this map to talk about the relationship of public and private space. So I was starting to think about what this map would look like now in the presence of CCTV and you know, telephones, video chat, all these different technologies which are entering uh, our cities now. I think it would be impossible to draw in the same way. You know, for a start, it would probably have to be three-dimensional, you know, in color, moving, and also different for every single person who uses it. So I think we can no longer think of private and public as universal spatial conditions. And we have to, uh, to have a new vocabulary now uh, which we can use to build in the city. So although the, this project is speculative and kind of wildly self-indulgent, I think it can be used to consider how we inhabit space today. Um, I'm using here augmented reality as a starting point, really, to, to start addressing the emerging ideas and trying to anticipate also some design challenges that we might have in the future. Um, personally, I don't believe in technological determinism, and I think that it's really up to us how we adopt technology. And I think videos and projects like this um, are very useful tools to start a conversation um, you know, across the board. So this is my uh, contact details. You can see all my work on my website at kgmaltzilo.com. And I'm also starting a new, this is very new actually, I just um, did this the other day, uh, a kind of think tank and, and design consultancy, uh, which is going to be like, using these kind of ideas to, to address a wide variety of issues. Um, this is really new, so if you go to the, the website there, there's kind of a call for applications that you can see. So if you'd like to get involved or, or help out in any way, um, please have a look and, and come and get me after this, because I've got no idea what I'm doing with it, so that would be great. All right, thank you very much. Well, I, um, we'll just have a couple of minutes for questions in a second. Uh, I've, again, I want to thank all of the speakers today. I think, you know, really interesting kind of overlap between how we conceive of what's private, what we conceive of as public, how that manifests itself in the internal space of our homes, how that manifests in the public space of the city. So, uh, Danny O'Brien, Anil Dash, Adam Brookfield, Keish Masuda. Uh, time for a couple of questions. Lily, here? Yeah. Yep, time for a couple of questions, and then we'll move on to our next stepping. Any questions for Keish? Over there. Yeah. Uh, your, uh, your idea of the overlay, uh, especially that last point you were making about what we could have in terms of a map to understand the openness of the world around us today, kind of made me think of Hobo Um and how we could have a collective sharing system across all of these like that really we share so that we can understand uh, what would be open to us as we go in places based on the apartment we would play for. I don't know, it's just an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Any question? Uh, yeah, I think it was something about a, a kind of a database or some way of accessing all the layers of content which are available so you can sort of search through that. And of course, with the web, there's all of, you know, a lot of work being done by many people here to, to look at how we can organize and structure that data. So if we try and apply that into space, then it, I think it shares many of the same qualities, but at the same time, it like, loses others and gains others as well. Um, but there's a, a, a um, there was a, character sort of profile developed by Walter Benjamin uh, of the Pleneur in the 18th century, um, or something, <laughs> but, uh, who was a, a person who just experienced the city by walking. And it was kind of like an urban dandy who sort of walked around in more very flamboyant clothes, and, and that was kind of what they did with their life. But I think that we could look to quite a return of that, where people could walk through the city and, and sort of experience different layers. Um, one of the, the, the things you see in sort of cities today is, um, I'm very interested in Chinatowns, in cities, because what you have is the, um, the kind of uh, local like urban fabric, which is then overlaid with 
with another sort of almost virtual layer of augmentation. So the lantern, the little bits of roof, and shop signs, things like that, which give it this kind of local character. Sorry, that's not a question at all. But um, <laughs> I mean, I, I just made a very like short stab at, at how to organize that data with the channel browser module that you saw. Um, but I imagine you know this is a huge problem. What I'm really doing is just asking the question rather than uh, providing any sort of solution. Thank you. <laughs> any other questions?